It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight, Dr. Marie-José Monzen. Dr. Monzen graduated from the École Normale Supérieure and received her doctorate in philosophy from the Centre d'Études et Civilisation Byzantine. She is currently the research director emeritus of the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, and she is also the di director of the Observatoire des Images Contemporaines Research Group at the Atelier Varan in Paris. Dr. Manzan's research primarily focuses on Byzantine culture and image theory, as well as on the analysis of contemporary art and on the relations between art, power, and politics. Her groundbreaking book, which in many ways serves as the inspiration behind today's conference, is entitled Image Icon Economy, the Byzantine Origins of the Contemporary Imaginary. And it argues that the power and ubiquity of the image in today's visual culture can be traced all the way back to the Byzantine iconoclastic controversy of the 8th and 9th centuries. Dr. Mazan convincingly draws a conceptual thread from the philosophical enterprise of the Byzantine era to the critical discourses surrounding our media-controlled and image-saturated contemporary life. Dr. Manzan has published widely in France, and among her other notable publications are Voix Ensemble, Le Commerce des Regards, L'Image peut-elle tuer, Homo Spectateur, Qu'est-ce que tu vois, and most recently, Image à suivre, which was published last year. The impressive scope of Dr. Manzan's scholarly interests and publications have ranged to include subjects as diverse as Vincent van Gogh, Michelangelo Sistine Ceiling, contemporary Chinese art, and the evolution of the fashion industry, to name but a few. Dr. Manzan has traveled all the way from Paris to join us here today and to deliver her keynote address on the work of the Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky. Her talk is entitled Voice and Incarnation in Contemporary Images, Patristic Thought in Tarkovsky's Films. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Manzan. I do apologize for speaking my English with my powerful French accent. And thank you in advance to speak to me slowly. From the beginning, I was convinced by two ideas. First, the Byzantine history was sustained by a real strong philosophical and anthropological and political thought. Second, Byzantine thought was the unknown or too unknown underground of our modernity, particularly in the main field of images, as the constituting condition of power, political power, and of any human community. I first, coming here, first intended to speak of union without confusion. Finally, I decided to broach the same issue through cinema. And I chose, or I chose, Tarkovsky's work. Speaking, I, I could have entitled my communication um, Iconic Turn, is a cinematographic term. Speaking about Tarkovsky's films as a philosopher raises two difficulties, each connected to the other. The first is a general difficulty common to all discursive disciplines of speaking about images. The second, echoing the first, is that to speak of Tarkovsky's work is to address an object that, in a singular way, creates a crisis in the speech itself that is at the heart of images. Because the poetry of iconicity, iconicity produces a commotion at the heart of philosophical language itself. The philosopher's voice becomes fragile and uncertain before the seismic events that are his films. Films that put speculative thought into a state of discomfort. When I look for where the philosophers are to be found in Tarkovsky's work, 
I do not find them in figures of eloquence or theory. To the contrary, there, only weakness and vertigo are found. I find philosophers in the bodies of children, in the wind's voice, in storms, or in a dog's apparition. It is these things that address science to the professionals of discourse or writing, signs that are at once tender and violent, signs that concerns meanings incarnation in the world's body, in a sort of shamanic form or rite. These signs manifest this presence of meaning in the figures found in the suspension of words, as if the coming of the word took place in silence. Thus, like a burst of indecipherable light, poetic speech arises. I will try to situate my speaking as best as I can, that is to say by testifying to a way of seeing, renouncing all academic theorizing of the way this work is viewed. Opening path, proposing connection, being the stalker, walker and watcher, because this work is par excellence, a meeting between gaze and thought that requests that the philosopher makes a radical return to the site where the enigma of the visible intersects sect with the visibility of the world. As the Christian fathers said one day, it's incarnation. Structurally, I do not consider Christians in any way to own this concept of visible incarnation. Because by inventing it, they provided the universal conceptualization of all images with the model of a renunciation of all possession of any capturing of the visible. Incarnation is the experience of being dispossessed of things. For the sake of vision, the experience of a transfiguration of the viewing, for to see an image is to see things in their absence. In Tarkovsky's films, symbols, citations, and references are so abundant the cinematographic, theological, poetic, artistic culture so ample and present that we could content ourselves with the decoding, we could yield to the temptation of a kind of erudite and less hermeneutic. I spoke of temptation, but I think that we could instead speak of a trap since, in the end, the commentaries treat films as objects of encrypted and coded communication. Each of Tarkovsky's films can be the object of successive and contradictory identifications without them ever having their authenticity either betrayed or illuminated in any way. No framework impoverishes it including that of Christian doctrine. If used as an interpretative lens, a work's freedom must remain illegible in a certain manner. Certainly the incarnation and trinity are related to this work, but on what level can it be understood while still maintaining the enigma. There are mysteries and shadows there that discourse must respect. The screen is not a jewel box filled with meaning. The visible is entirely where the gaze meets 
not a discourse significations, but the meaning of the word. It cannot, it cannot be a matter of transforming the image into a rebus to decipher, but as in a Paulinian enigma to be experienced. The indeterminate and interminable proliferation of visual and sound signs reflect endlessly back to strata and layers of meaning that come together to construct the plane on which the visible is inscribed on the screen. Now, this surface totally preserves the viewer's position and freedom on which Tarkovsky never imposes an unequivocal religious message. How does what inspires him leave us free to wend our way through these films with our own story? Like any great creator, he makes sure the meaning of what he shows is given neither intentionally by him nor allegorically by the image, nor metaphorically by the word. There is no bottom line, no secret message, no last word. The image is open, exposed. Its meaning yet to come, to be constructed by us, there for each of us to re-elaborate starting from, from the present, which is ours, from the history that is ours. The power of an image is founded in its undecidable polysemy. We are affected by it, and its force comes from the energy that liberates us. That was the fundamental, perhaps and true, iconic teaching. All these faces in all these landscapes are our faces caught in the geology of a world that is forever ours, a world of waste and promise. Tarkovsky did not create icons, but makes iconic thought still living in our modern world. However, if I am here, I owe it perhaps to long years spent in the company of Byzantine images and texts that nourish Russian Orthodox thought, as well as to the homage I have repeatedly been able to give to the work of Tarkovsky. I will not assume the position of expert or erudite. What could possibly be an expert in the matter of incarnation? When I saw Andrei Rublev for the first time, my emotion was considerable, and I set out to take each step of Rublev's passion all the way up to his resurrection, up to this resurrection of the world and image. I clearly saw the path of the passion the lesson of shadows that travel through the space, the, spa the space of pain, silence, and death to lead the artist from the mute night to the pascal light of images. I saw the word and image flow together, the chime of triumph and redemption, but this world, totally familiar to the theologian of or believer that I am not. Was here no longer the world of icons, but truly the world of cinema, a cinema born in Soviet countries, cheering the icon away from the church and associating the adventure of looking to the constitution of a new assembly. The gathering together of viewers to whom Tarkovsky addresses signs that question their servitude or their freedom, thus their desires. Cinema, produced by the hands, human hands, and the gaze of the creator of the film, 
Evans, Childhood, Mirror, Stalker, Solaris, Nostalgia, Sacrifice. How then is cinema connected to the incarnation of the word on the screen? I continued to see the film of Tarkovsky entering slowly into the indecipherable enigma of the visible. For 20 years, this adventure of the gaze of looking accompanied my philosophical and political work on the question of the gaze in the production of the visible and of cinematographic works. My conviction came together little by little. Today, engagement in cinematographic production has a singular signification that has been associated since its birth to the history of visibilities in the Western Christian world. This signifies that if the intellectual and spiritual history of Christianity enabled cinema to be invented, it is in that capacity that it is also rela related to Tarkovsky's film. I mean that his films inscribe a meaning that concerns the totality of cinematographic history. The Christian theory of icon gives its plenary signification to this work in the measure that it shows the path of meaning for all cinematographic enterprises. Tarkovsky answers for what he does just as all great artists are accountable for an image of humanity. I could also state this another way by saying that the filmmaker's freedom, his spiritual and political responsibility, is inscribed in Christianity's more enigmatic heritage. There, there the incarnation is not a divine or religious matter, but a human adventure, one understood in terms of image and the management of earthly visibilities. Tarkovsky's cinema is neither religious nor sacralizing, it is anthropogenic cinema. There, man is created in the image of humanity. Tarkovsky places the cinematographic gesture in a site of historical responsibility as regards the modern definition of humanity. To film a face is a way to give birth to humanity itself. Humanity is nothing other than the image that we produce of ourselves. The, the cinematographic gesture is thus a fictional gesture of great gravity, since it works with a world of visibility that may have taken us hostage. The question is, is cinema condemned to be nothing but the idol industry? Or is it something else, perhaps, for example, an art? The question that the church wanted to resolve, that of knowing which form of power we take in making images, is posed by cinema as an open crisis. This question can be formulated as follows. Can be the assembly, assembly of a film's viewers be constituted by the form of the film itself as a free assembly of, of speaking subject desiring to share a world for a new humanity yet to come? I could say laconically that to believe in the incarnation is to produce cinema. Why do we say in French, incarnate on screen? If the doctrine of the incarnation 
was a solemn legitimization of the visible, finally freed from the suspicion of idolatry, then all the Western art history is a consequence of this doctrine. Now for cinema, being an art and an industry, the question that is posed is that of knowing whether it can be both at the same time without contradiction, or if it can only be art by breaking away from the industry, or inversely, if as an industry, it must renounce art and it become just idle pr producer. In short, the question is to know if the freedom for a gaze that chooses or does not choose its own freedom through industry and capitalist in modernity, arts freedom and the industry's constraints come together to make us responsible in return for the meaning that we wish to give to all visibilities. Tarkovsky's film appealed to all our desires to see, to experience pleasure, to think, to speak, and so on. What are we going to do about it? He made a choice because for him, cinema is an industry that questions the destiny of the gaze, cast on the words of works of the industry itself. His films view cinema as an industry saved by art. Thus, cinema, as uh, he sees cinema as a, a major writing of own, our own history. He makes cinema's redemption operate in his treatment of the image in his singular inscription of the visible on the screen. The history of the world, is it or isn't it a cheap, a cheap wreck? I could um, quote the last film of Jean-Luc Godard, film Socialism, about our shipwreck. It's another conference. <laughs> the cinematographic gesture only illuminates the iconic doctrine of the incarnation of which Tarkovsky's vocation is a jubilant, necessary, and painful consequence. I say painful and jubilant because the cinematographic adventure is passionate, sacrificial, but also resurrectional, perhaps, and full of hope. The gaze is seized by the poetic enchantment, but inconsolable anxiety of each image. Each instant of darkness is fashioned by its own radiance. Every word, every sound is perceived in the singularity of a silence. In other words, no sign appears in its compactness to be an unequivocal thing, but the alterity of its contradiction passes tirelessly through it. And there is the important lesson, perhaps, of the iconic incarnation. I mean, the meaning of what we see is in what is unseen. The meaning of what we hear is in what is unheard. The word in Greek, aikon, expresses well what the word imago lost in Latin. It concerns the indecisive, indecisive and unstable semblance, a resemblance to an absence, an object of uncertainty offered up to opinion and judgment something which could be named a non-object. I like to speak of zone and membrane, which is another lecture too. This commitment of incarnation to meaning in the heart of the industry requires a return to the Christian device of incarnation. 
Cinema's calling is here no more an idolatry of the visible and much less an addiction to spectacle, but an unconditional loyalty to the world as was defended and sustained in orthodox spirituality by the fathers, first Greek, then Russian. This means that iconic thought has offered for the first time a modern and secular possibility, secular, possibility of redeeming the way we look at the world through refusing a glutinous conception of the visible. Now cinema as a modern industry of mass spectacle is precisely the art upon which falls the responsibility of either the freedom or the enslavement of gazes, thoughts and body. Making films thus engages all filmmakers to be responsible for the meaning that is to be given to the adventure of filmmaking worldwide. Wide. In the visible of good, uh, sorry, is the visible of a good to be consumed or the fragile enigma of sharing in the sensory? Tarkovsky inscribes his filmmaking gesture in the depth of this specifically political problematic, where the term political denotes here the construction of a space shared by human beings speaking together and desiring separately. We can understand Tarkovsky as a filmmaker against Hollywood. Philosophers have for a long time considered images to be suspect or untrustworthy and thus having no place or function in the city. Only language seemed capable to them of bringing together universally those who were divided by their patience and intimate desires. Sharing in a vision, the incarnation was the invention of the universality of meaning through patience and intimate desires. The question was thus that of finding the universal dimension of this passionate visible. What sort of visibility needed to be agreed upon to make the community of desires thinkable? The doctrinal response was as follows. The son, at the image of the father, saved the image and returned dignity to the visible. To be incarnated is to become image. To become image is thus to take on flesh. When the word was made flesh, it became image, but not body. Thus, all images celebrate the presence of a word in the absence of a body. Thus, all images celebrate, uh, sorry, a complex and powerful response since from that point on all image makers will give flesh, flesh to the word. If not, they will give a body to idols and make the visible fall back into a silence with no redemption, no sharing and community. The passion is the story of the redemption of the visible by the sacrifice of a body that consented to die so that the image would be resuscitated, hence the flesh of the world. The history of image, therefore, has a passionate, mortal, and resurrectional history. The universality of the visible is therefore founded not in the contents of vision, but in the meaning that is produced and shared by the community of gazes cast upon the image. What does it mean to share a vision? 
it will never be by definition reducing a multiplicity of living beings to a single organ's activity. Each as of us has two eyes and no known sees what another sees. So we will never be able to agree on what we see in terms of sharing. Now, what does we share if not language? Thus, in all images, or rather, in all visibility, agreement is reached only through the invisibility of an audible or silent word, but in whose name it's understood that this multitude that sees together is a multitude of speaking subjects who, through the incarnating, incarnating image, hear meaning and create politics. Tarkovsky's film are radically faithful to this iconic way of understanding the doctrine and charges cinema with making the word heard that is producing the community of meaning through the incarnation of the visible. But let it be clear that this meaning is not in the image. Since I have dismissed hermeneutic, where is the meaning to be found? Where is it situated? A new laconic response, nowhere. Cinemas make the screen into a sightless, sightless sight, a place where meaning is not sheltered, a zone of turbulence buffeted by the winds of desires. Let us pursue this doctrinal listening a little further to get closer to the weaving together of iconic and sound signs, because in these films, the shot is defined not visually, but temporally. The shot is constructed in the special exigency of listening, and its, ex its expansion is not in space, but in time. Like the musician who inscribes his movement in the singular ar architecture that welcomes a line of sound. The camera can remain Im immobile and the space given to the gaze can expand progressively, growing bigger, unable to end. The operation of the visible seemed to want to give the word to eternity, not as the promise of a world that is outside our world, but in the cinematographic stakes of the world's being present to itself in each moment. Homage given to the act of being born in each appearing of things and body. If to show is to be heard, then what sort of nature do voices have? How do they circulate? In the iconic tradition, the voice that announces, like the voice that designates, are voices that authenticate the visible as an index stretched out towards the image. In icons, this is called epigraphy, epigraphy. The inscription of the name being the sign of the voice that authenticates the contract between the visible and meaning's invisibility. This is why the annunciation and all announcing positions of messenger and conveyor is a site of creation both the voice which designates and the index that shows address ears and eyes the ad this address does not does not release any message but rather the name of a breath a direction the voice which announces the womb's fertility from the image 
will emerge the, the annunciating voice that belongs to Abraham's three visitors, the voice of John the precursors. All of these voice all announce the arrival of an awaited figures, not a real, not the, the arrival of the figure of a real truth, but only the arrival of a possible truth yet to come. We might usually believe that human voices are closer to speech than noises. Here, in Tarkovsky's film, it's entirely the contrary otherwise. The world and nature are birthing with words and meanings that human ears cannot hear and, cannot, and can no longer hear. But these humans, these humans speak and make speeches that all more or less make a mess of the word. Words, words, words we hear in the sacrifice resounding as well as in stalker a desperate exclamation taking, taken, sorry, taken from Shakespeare. Words are not the word. They are idols, idolatrous signs. This is why the here enters image as the organ absolutely representative of the cinemat cinematographic gesture. In profile or from behind, a body cannot longer fall victim to the possible abyss of the face. Poetry resonates thus as a reminder of the power of the word in another art, that of writing. But Tarkovsky does not write, he films. He incarnates the voice of things and bodies. The voice falls, explodes, swoops down in though, on those who welcome the word, this word that falls in snow, and not as the snow, that patters in the rain, not as the rain, the voice that breathes through the wind, not as the wind, the voice that issues forth from machines, mortars, sliding into footsteps, under tires, into the explosion of falling glass. The voice flowing with rivers, streaming with milk, rippling with seaweed. The word is an energy spread out through all nature. Such is as in a shamanic power of iconic. In the world of the most ordinary things and objects, everything murmurs or utters a sign that our ears must learn to gather, a sign whose desire and mourning are enunciated at the same time by human speech. The soundtrack makes the image tremble and the voice of actors tells of the tearing apart of language when it turns into the desire of the word attained by meaning. The sounds of the world are not metaphors, but are seized by the incarnation itself, the way the image was announced and took on flesh the moment the visible came together with words. We are talking here about the word whose attentive listening and whose trace of visibility are is inscribed by the icon. The poetic word of the poet father, Arsene Tarkovsky, refers back to the voice of the father who legitimates the visibility of a son and the iconic productivity of his hands. In this space where messages are sent and received, art of image, iconic art, is at once a love letter and hospitality from father to the son. I said earlier that the place of meaning 
was nowhere and constructed by the word breathing through all things. The movement and circulation of visual and sound signs institute, despite everything, a space even in its geometry is fragile and unstable. This space is that of the image on the screen, a tenuous space, breakable, a sort of seismic soil no one can stand in without difficulty. One, um, this is the enigma of a, sh of a st shimmering and limping world. One walks in, his, in its zigzagging bent over limping, bumping into things. One falls, one designs trajectories in all direction of the space, spaces of a remar remarkable clumsiness, fugitive wavering, be it aerial or aquatic. It is a space made of imbalances, falls, shipwreck, as well as flight. The space has no limit, no weight, and can at any given moment swell up or empty out. It is a space that asks, asks us what it means to then stand up. It is not a matter of holding onto a place but onto oneself, which can only take place in a state of continuous mobility. All stopping threatens collapse. In an infinity in which each appearance produces incertitude, in this cosmic extension, extension of expectations and catastrophes, People move according to the measure of their bodies, of their steps. The step is like a word, generator of humanity. How to produce meaning in such an unassignable topology? In a way, solitude can answer the question of meaning. Nowhere meaning ever belongs to anyone. Meaning is not in the image, nor in a place, no more than any one of us occupies a place that can, can truly be ours, our position. Life is only an uninterrupted displacement, an unceasing game of displacement between places where nothing can reside, settle, find comfortable rest, a sleep of spirit, but where the world produces, despite everything, hospitality, a temporary address. We are exiled from our first cry on, separated from our birthplace. To access language and arrive at speech are intrinsically founded on the ordeal of separation and sacrifice. We must live to find our voice. We must walk to hear it and listen to voice of any other. With no refuge, no rest, our memory only offers its treasures to the desire, to the one who keeps walking, never to satisfaction and assuagement. Never a seat, no one ever sits. Desire's place is itself placeless, even not utopic. Thus, it is also impossible to assimilate this work's imaginary to a Christian imaginary because salvation is not in the city of God, somewhere else, but here and now in each, in each instance of desire, extreme tension. 
images always operates between urgency and patience. On this itinerant trajectory of insatiable desire, the face of exile and the traveler are indivisible from the face of hospitality. Because the film of Tarkovsky are constructed as a land in which all of humanity is welcomed, even though he himself only ever knew exile everywhere. I say everywhere because birthplace like the maternal bosom, like roots, are simply memories flower, nostalgias inherent to the wandering of all life. Nothing is more a brew than this fidelity to exile and invisibility in this homage to hospitality. Coming from far away and still remaining away is the only way to let freedom and alterity occur. Thus, the inevitable melancholy of a restless work offers no rest to our thought. To meet and welcome somebody unknown is the art of hospitality. And art of image is art of hospitality. All things exist only in the flesh of image and in the present vibration of voices and sounds. Hospitality is therefore not a biblical allegory meant to present messianism, and even less so the only dogmatism of a trinit trinitarian theology. As we know, the famous icon of Rublev, entitled Trinity, is first, essentially, an icon of the hospitality of Abraham. I think that in Tarkovsky, Trinity offers, refers to two things, wandering and hospitality. In Rublev, <coughs> sorry, in Rublev's icon, Trinitarian hospitality constructs the space of welcome for all, for all words and images. The Trinity begins when hospitality begins. Cinema is the land of welcome, a work open to the freedom of encounters which can only produce the image of some third party, some other which designates the viewer as the third place of an address that the creator and the image offer he offers need in order to find the place of return. Be nowhere, possess nothing, give everything, receive the gift of possible and impossible. This is what the three visitors of Rublev's icon announce. In reality, there are six persons in prisons. Three are visible in the icon, messengers from the invisible world, three angels stopping and sharing of the meal. But this meal is served by two hosts who were real, invisible in the icon, learning from their trans visitors that they will be the progenitor of the belated child, Isaac. That is a human family, three persons a triangle outside the declarative field. Beneath our eyes are the figures of their welcome, the Trinitarian figures of the announcement. They came at three to speak. This is what cinema does, taking on not only the rendering visible of the visible, but also the invisible all the Trinitarian inclusions that support the image outside its frame of camera. The mediation of announcing voices institutes 
an infinite triangulation demanded by all the effect of meaning. As in an encounter on the road of Emmaus, there must be three to be able to share the table of meaning. The power of the third is also that of the word between what one sees and what all must hear. Ternarity, ternarity is the structure of all circulation of signs, of all production of meaning. The messaging function, the operation of announcement, the use of letters, all messaging systems, be they inter interplanetary, like in Solaris, <coughs> or intersubjective in other films, are the same. The abyss that separates us from each other is as vast as the emptiness that separates stars. The irreducibility of intersubjective distances can only be resolved through the crafting of messaging systems of epistolary exchanges, such are the operation of iconicity. Giving the form of a dispatch, an address, to the circulation of signs is so strongly inscribed in the films of Tarkovsky that each time his face is turned towards the horizon that confronts them or towards another, the napes of their necks and their gazes are pivoting on an invisible axis that is, not, that is none other than the infinite diagonal of address. The visible is the construction <coughs> of a veil upon which and through which we see meaning from behind. No one ever turns his back to us. We walk together toward the same unknown destination because we only know the nape of truth, never its face. Two biblical texts established this retroversion of the gaze. In Exodus, the vision of Moses to whom God refuses his face but lets its back be seen. In Genesis, the work of Noah's son who approached their naked father to cover, it, to cover up his nudity, but while veiled and walking backwards. The screen, as I have said, is not a jewel box of meaning, the chest in which a secret, a secret is stored. It is uh, the veil upon which and through which meaning is inscribed, inscribed. The surface that offers itself up, up to be read. The screen is the plane in which the veiled appearance of meaning is inscribe, inscribed in the same time visible and illegible. Memory and rememberings do not rely on citations of what has been, but is not longer, no longer anymore than they do on referring to what is known, read, understood, stored, and more or less conserved. To the contrary, Memory refers to an intimate disrupting of all past reference, a disruption at the heart of the most violent shock, a shock imprinted by the present, like Benjamin <laughs> explained. All horizontality of a linear temporality is abruptly recaptured vertically. Memory is itself marked by the seal of disposition, but in memory of capital gesture is played out. 
not the transmission of meaning, but the desire of meaning. Meaning as the voice of desire. Here, perhaps, is the fidelity of Byzantine thought, endless voice of a desire in the core of icon. Maintaining the heat and light of a flame in the darkness of broad daylight, that is the cinematographic gesture. The script that underlies all scripts. It's why nostalgia is never regret, a movement of retention and or evocation of what is absent, but more in incarnation in the remnants present faces of what is no longer, in, what, in all that is present at each moment, a reading of traces and the sacrifice of control take place. To burn, to set a flame, is to submit to the fire of all catastrophes, the desire to possess, to worship the signs themselves idolatrously. Everything that can be consumed must be consumed. The idols of certainty are the ruins we leave behind in this landscape of ashes, water and wind be welcoming breathe, and the spirits living, even vivifying uncertainties. From the beginning on, speaking about mystery makes me think, of course, about Paul's prodigious expression in the first letter to Corinthians, that Caliph qualifies our present gaze into truth, where he says that we only see the truth in the world dimly, as in a mirror. Blepon en gar arti, desestropon en enigmati. A mirror that does not double the world, but enigmatically directs the gaze into a dissimilar space of another nature. It is about conceiving of the cinema as the enigmatic mirror of the world's truth. Cinema is an art of the real, but it is the real that comes back with the cinema as its starting point, not its ending point. The film of Tarkovsky includes the mirror's operation in their trinitarian, ternarity, I mean, or if one prefers ternary structure, while the mirror could become a completely binary specular operator whose identifying effects are linked in the fable of Narcissus to illusory and deadly effects, the Pauline mirror like the cinematographic mirror, swats our fusional reconciliation. This is a mirror that can also be called Augustinian, as if, as it is, it is by its light, that Augustine, Augustine sees the manifestation of Trinity, I prefer tenarity. The mirror is not an instrument of specular duplication, but the absolute operator of alterity. All reflection is an image, not of the same, but of the other. It is about seeing in the mirror plane the overturning of the spaces between a subject's real body confronting the mirror and the intangible image of the desiring subject meeting the other in the mirror. Now cinema is entirely caught up in this beat, this incessant pulsation of body and flesh, image, same and other. The image in the mirror is not coextensive to the world as its reflection, 
but it is, on the contrary, the operator of the overflowing, overflowing of the Im immeasurable. There is more in this world that can possibly be reflected in a mirror. But there, are, there is more in the mirror signs that can possibly be shown by the world. The excessiveness of meaning in relation to the frame recalls that the great father says about images. They said that the limited womb of the virgin had contained the word that the finite had us been the container of the infinite, that the content was infinitely larger than the body that welcomed it. They called the Virgin a mirror without blemish, Cora of Akoreton. So I think of Tarkovsky's hand lift up in front of his face, delimiting with his fingers the frame in which he will bring forth the infinity of the visible, doing the gesture. The invisibility of the word. I cannot forget this gesture during the filming of Sacrifice, where I see him constructing the space with his body where the word would be inscribed in time, framing with his finger the infinite. In effect, it is in terms of excess that we must understand the distance that forever separates what we see from what we say, what we say from what we see. The world exceed, exceeds science, and science exceeds the world. This incommensurability of science and the world, <coughs> sorry, creates an infinite depth in the works that designate the world through signs and submit it to the freedom of these signs. This is why the film of Tarkovsky are not, in a certain sense, analyzable or rather irreducible to an analyst. Each element of nature is gesture each skull surges forth like a proper name, never generically or conceptually. I won't say that it rains in Tarkovsky's film, but every rain, in every rain, every drop bursts in an insistent and singular way, exploding like a cry on the edge of the world's lips in order to say something that had not yet been said and which won't be said again, perhaps forever. The question is posed again in each surface. How do image and sound produce an irreplaceable temporality? If at each moment it is all of humanity that is in danger, threatened, with extension, then cinema bears today a crushing responsibility. Either it should help us living, live together, sharing the image and the word, or it would serve barbarity and promote the idolatry of the visible. Tarkovsky's film testify to his choosing a cinema that desires life for humanity. This is, for me, his real link with the original thought of incarnation and icon. I never can forget that he has paid the price by his own life. Far from our world to, to stay, yes, as in impossible, uh, far with, uh, I can't forget that he has paid his pr the price with his own life in an impossible exile from far from our world to stay closer, to maintain infidelity.
to our truth. Thank you.